The Strategic Hot Box with Dr. Brandy Love Stankovic. Discussing leadership, business, and how to take control of your life and achieve greatness. From the streets of Las Vegas, energized, informed, and never diluted. It's time to kick some ass. Hey, it's your girl, Dr. Brandy Stankovic. Welcome back to the Strategic Hot Box. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Again, this is another great episode on site. We're getting in it. We're in the dirt, sleeves rolled up, and really excited to be here with Jason Smith, a competitive racing instructor. And we're going to have some fun today. For, if for anyone is watching, if this is your first time on the Strategic Hot Box. First, thank you. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. And we learn love and we kick ass. So in the learn section, we're going to get to know something new. We're going to hear from a subject matter expert. We're going to learn about some lessons that we've had over our time and experience. And then in the love section, we'll talk about the importance of networking, relationships, choosing love in business and making things happen. And then finally, my favorite part, we're going to talk about kicking ass and we'll leave all the listeners and followers with some kick ass takeaways to execute immediately. And uh, I mentioned in the last one, for those that have heard some other episodes, that this is our season five. So now that we're in season five and we're pretty much veterans at this whole podcast thing, we've taken it to the next level. We're always trying to push the boundaries for each of you. So the, now we are doing some virtual uh, podcasts. We're doing some in-studio podcasts. We're doing some on-site, like we are right now, coming to you live from Pahrump, Nevada. And so it's a really exciting time to do, to switch things up, to mix it up and have different formats. So I'm really excited to have all of you here with us today. And so we're going to talk about driving fast. And I am not a fast driver. As a matter of fact, my kids uh, and most of my friends make fun of me for driving the speed limit because I feel like I don't want to pay for tickets if I don't need to pay for tickets. And if I'm in a hurry, then maybe I'll drive a little bit more aggressively. But uh, um, I'm not much of a road rager. But Jason Smith, are you a road rager? You know, not on the street. Uh, I spend so much time driving on the racetrack. I spend so much time driving on courses, fixed courses. Uh, on the street, I'm actually kind of slow. Yeah. Uh, same thing. I don't want tickets. I don't want to draw attention to myself. Uh, it's just easier to take it slow when I'm out there on the street with everybody else. What drives you crazy about normal pedestrian driving? Normal pedestrian driving or mm -hmm. just normal driving on the street? Normal driving on the street, normal people. It's, it's got to be those people that sit in the passing lane instead of in the driving lane. Like if mm -hmm. they sit in the passing lane and just drive slow, mm -hmm. uh, you should be over to the right. And if they're blocking traffic, it's hard for everybody to get by. It's hard for traffic to get through. Those people drive me nuts. And what do you do? Lay on the horn? Do you tailgate? You just bitch. Sit there and bitch and complain <laughs> and that's it. I, again, I don't cause a whole lot of, uh, I don't want to cause a whole lot of attention to myself. So I don't tailgate. I don't get in their face. I don't flash lights. I just sit there. Take yeah. it. Have you always driven fast then? Like, was this like, you know, those little Tyco, the red ones with the yellow tops that like <laughs> one-year-olds, were you zooming around the backyard on your big wheel? No, definitely not. Uh, I've always liked, like from a young age, ridden dirt bikes. Um, I didn't start racing until I was about 20 years old, 21 years old. I started driving on different racetracks and courses, autocrosses, and then started road racing right away. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that I've always been, me and my dad have done a lot of uh, dirt bike riding when I was younger. But it so do you prefer the dirt or do you like the concrete? You know, the both are, I, I'm going to have to say I prefer the dirt now. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just dirt bikes, but racing off-road. That's, that's one of my fortes. It's what I do, coach and train and drive. Um, but I started in asphalt years ago. Mm -hmm. Started at Miller Motorsports Park for the Ford Racing School up in uh, Tooele, Utah, or Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, that's where my racing career started a long time ago. What's the difference? What's the difference? I know that I prefer driving on the street because it's more predictable, mm -hmm. but... Uh, but yeah, clearly this is my forte. What's the difference? Uh, I think the asphalt, uh, you nailed it. Uh, it's more predictable. It's the same thing, lap after lap after lap. So you can work on taking the car to the limits, taking your own uh, mental capacity and your own ability to, to the limits because the course doesn't change over and mm -hmm. over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, dirt changes every lap, every time you come through that section. Uh, the whoops get bigger, sand changes, uh, or there's rocks in the course now. Um, I, that's the big thing is asphalt's predictable. It's the same thing over mm -hmm. and over. Not like that's a bad thing. Um, with off-road racing, with riding uh, dirt bikes, 
it changes mm -hmm. each time you come through that same So section. when you said the whoops get bigger, is that like the whoop, the whoop de whoops Pretty or much. is that like, ah, oh, shit, whoops? <laughs> it could be either of those. Uh, when when an, an off-road racer refers to whoops, uh, whoops are, are basically like up little up and down hills and, and sometimes they're little like stutter bumps, bumps or braking bumps. Um, you'll see trophy trucks, UTVs going through sometimes two and a half foot whoops, like mm -hmm. whoops that will come up to your waist that you'll go up and down. Mm -hmm. And the driver has to figure the best way over the top or through it as quickly as possible. So. But one of the things you also said about pavement is because it's predictable, you can push yourself. So mm -hmm. you kind of know and you can push every time. Is, that, is there benefit to that? Um, obviously, you can push a certain vehicle to the limits uh, and know this specific part did this. Uh, same thing on the dirt, but it's, it's not like you can rely on the course being exactly the same. So if you enter at a certain mile per hour with this much brake pressure, it changes. So that's going to change. How you drive is going to change. Mm -hmm. How fast you go through that specific section in the dirt is going to change compared to the asphalt. It's a little bit more predictable. Mm -hmm. What's the wildest, craziest race you've ever done? <laughs> Uh, it's going to have to be 2016 Baja 1000. Mm. It was very long. Uh, I don't know how in depth you want me to get there. Well, was a thousand means a thousand, thousand miles. Yeah. So the Baja 1000 is held in Ensenada, uh, Baja California, Mexico every year in November. It's mm -hmm. a thousand miles. Uh, they usually race it in a big loop. So, uh, either, uh, start big loop around the peninsula and then come back or they race point to point, which means they'll start in Ensenada and end in La Paz or, Mm -hmm. uh, rarely Cabo, but at the very bottom of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And it's usually anywhere from 900 miles to, I think this year coming up, it's like 1,300 miles. Wow. So. And so what happened in 2016? Did you like fall out of the goal? Did uh, you roll it? All of it. Name it. Um, really? That, yeah, we can start with the story. The race started at 5 o'clock, uh, sorry, noon on a Friday. Mm -hmm. We raced through the night. Um, and at this point, I wasn't, I was the finishing driver, so I was uh, providing help to the crew, um, you know, chasing the race if any of the trucks needed fixed. About noon uh, on Saturday, so 24 hours into the race, we got word that one of our trucks was stuck and broken and, and couldn't con go any further. We found on the map where he was, and he was the farthest area from civilization, a road. Oh, man. We left the pavement about 5 in the afternoon on Saturday and didn't find them till 1 in the morning, Sunday morning. Wow. They were buried in silt. We had to first fix the truck, dig it out of the silt, get going again with two trucks now on the course, and we were still six hours on this dirt road in the middle of nowhere in the middle of Baja, California. Along the way, uh, almost rolled my personal Raptor down a cliff, trying to find back to the road. We came to a warehouse in the middle of the desert with a landing strip that we can only think was some I mean, sort. this sounds like movies, like scary movies I can are keep made going. out I can of keep this. Going. Like it, it, in the moonlight, <laughs> you're rolling down, there's cactus. And so is it actually a race? Is who finishes first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's time. So it's not like you're racing wheel to wheel. You don't start right next to somebody. It's all timed. So they start uh, every car every 30 seconds. So the mm -hmm. first you know, five, three or three to five drivers get like a minute that they are, and that's what you get for qualifying so well. Mm -hmm. And then after that, every 30 seconds, they send a car. Mm -hmm. So it's all when you start the race, what time is it? How long does it take you until you cross the finish line with flat tires, with fixing the car, with crashes, with rolling it. Obviously those who fix less cars, fix less flat tires, don't mm -hmm. roll their car over, put it in a ditch. Um, or almost roll down a cliff. I mean, that's got to be the goal, right? No ditches, yes, no rolling. No or do you, are you always riding that line, no. pushing the limit? Well, you're always riding the limit, yeah, because otherwise you're not moving very fast. Mm. Um, so, but you try not to. The, the, and that's where asphalt, you can go 95%, 98%. Mm -hmm. However, in off-road, you're keeping that to 90%, 92%, 85% mm. of what is available to you as a driver because those who drive 100% always end up in the ditch. Yeah. It's about moving quickly, but not to being the point where we're going to make adapt. a big mistake. And you have to be able to do that, being able to adapt, yes. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to do that for 32 hours if the race goes well. Sure. For us, 65 and oh, 72 wow. hours. So you didn't win that one, you're saying. You didn't win that one. <laughs> and so you think a good driver then drives on the asphalt and the dirt? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think there's something short-sighted in saying uh, a road racer will never be good off-road and an off-road racer will never be good on the road because... Uh, it's all weight distribution and weight management. When you mm -hmm. hit the brakes, where does the weight go? To the front of the car. When mm -hmm. you accelerate, where does the weight go? To the back. So if you manage that properly, every car, whether it's a long travel trophy truck or UTV or a Corvette, the weight 
goes the same. The, the weight ends up in the same areas. So right. as long as you're managing that, and of course there's more travel and a long and a long travel trophy truck or UTV, uh, there's less movement in a Corvette as it dips and dives. Mm -hmm. But it's all the same, and it can be learned. And on asphalt, you also practice with like wet environments and mm. gravelly environments, right? Yeah. So my day job is I work at the Spring Mountain uh, Resort and Spring Mountain Motorsports Club and Resort. So uh, here we house the uh, Corvette driving school for new drivers. So when you buy a Corvette, Chevy sends you to our school. So my day in and day out, I was teaching Corvette drivers to drive fast on a racetrack. Mm. Um, we, we put them through braking exercises. We put them through uh, wet exercises where they're allowed to slide the car and learn some car control. Um, so like if they go home and drive in the snow or the rain and the car gets sideways, hopefully they know how to I mean, correct a Corvette's that not that. a good weather car, right? Not necessarily. It's not the best. In other words, yeah. it, it can get around fine. I've driven them in the snow. I've driven them in the rain. Um, I've driven them on the racetrack in the rain. It'll get around fine if you know what you're doing. Is mm -hmm. it the best? No. Get a Tahoe. <laughs> so when people buy, I have to know this and, you know, gauge what is right for you to answer, but the kind of people that are buying Corvettes, are they coming in already skilled drivers? Not necessarily, because I, th I think the number is like 15%, you know, 12% of Corvette drivers actually take their car on the racetrack. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come here and it's a, it's a bucket list item for them. It's a thing they do, oh, I bought a new Corvette, so I'm going to come. I bought this, this is the, now we're on the generation C8, they call it, mm -hmm. um, the C7. You know, you see a lot of drivers continue to come back. Um, so no, not it's a lot of them. It's included with purchasing a Corvette? Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I, sh I shouldn't say that. Uh, Chevy or GM will, uh, I think, give you a certain amount of money. It's half the school is paid for mm -hmm. um, when you come. You still have to obviously book your flights, and there's a little bit extra left over, but Chevy takes care of a pretty large portion wow, of it. Wow, that's really cool. So, I mean, it's not like Corvettes are like the cheapest thing in the entire world, but... Uh, they're not necessarily, no. Uh, and so do people come in with a chip on their shoulder then? How do you even begin to teach somebody that's just bought a fancy race car Actually, how to drive it? Actually, not... Most people come here ex excited, and mm -hmm. it's it, again, it's like a bucket list item. It's something they've booked six so months in advance. there's humility in it. A lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's a small percentage of people that come through and think they know more than the people that do it every single day. Um, but it's rare somebody comes through with a chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, most people, this is like the grown men Disneyland. Mm -hmm. So everybody's, excuse me, everybody's really excited to be here. Everybody's excited to show up. Um, you know, everybody like, oh, you, you must really love what you do. You, you, I, I would trade you in a heartbeat. And these are doctors and, right. and businessmen and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, I did notice prior to filming the podcast that I tried to use the ladies' room and it was locked. <laughs> uh, but so I'm assuming there's not a lot of ladies that come through. You know, actually, we have one or two per school. Um, we had three in the Cadillac school. Um, it's it's definitely a higher percentage of of males that come through, but mm -hmm. every school has one or two. So I don't know why this wasn't unlocked. That's weird. So. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Nick, Nick snuck me into the men's bathroom. Good. I'm not sure we should say that, but it's out there now. So uh, no, it's totally totally fine. So have you like when do you encourage the students then to push the limits when they're here? Um, because it's the safest place, you know. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna screw up, if you're yeah. gonna f up, this would be the place to have something like that yeah. happen because you're amongst. Um, professionals, you're amongst emergency services or whatever, yeah. but you also don't want to come here and wreck a car. Yeah, so we encourage them to push their limits, push their comfort level, but not necessarily to the point where they're going to wreck a car. And it's my, my normal speech, hey, gentlemen, this is the end of the day. It's been a long two days. Let's have fun. Let's drive fast, but let's concentrate on being accurate and precise. This isn't a race. Um, remember what we learned yesterday in emergency braking. Uh, so we encourage them to step out of their comfort zone and push their own limits a little bit but not to the point where they're going to wreck a car or drive, even drive off track. Can you <clears throat> profile a student the sec they, second they walk in? <laughs> I'd like to say no, but uh, you can tell some. Yeah. Some of them, uh, a, a lot of them are older. Um, some of them immediately start into their experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the funny thing is, like, usually the quiet drivers that show up in, not necessarily driving shoes, but show up in normal shoes. And it's those guys that have lots of experience. It's mm. the ones that have the most all the... Hum, hum, people that are most humble always yes. end up because they don't have to flash the... Yep. Yeah, that's the ones in the driving shoes and then pull up in their racing gloves. It's like, okay. Really? People come in with like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Racing. I, we've even had a few show up in race suits and wear their race suits. Like a, a fire suit? A race, full race suit, like with past sponsors and stuff on it. Hmm. Um, and then wear it around for two days. So everybody's different. I, I get that he's here for an experience. He's having right. fun. He enjoys it. Sure. Um, but 
I, you can usually tell when they walk yeah. out and, and even the questions that they ask sometimes. So I think that, I mean, really to the things that I do and for those that are listening um, that aren't necessarily in this general arena is that I know that when students come in and they come in like in the, the metaphorical race suit, mm -hmm. I almost find myself complimenting those individuals because clearly they're seeking that kind of affirmation as it is, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of being turned off by something like that, I usually use it as an opportunity to build affinity or build a relationship with somebody because it they they need that but you're right about the people that the people that have their shit together don't need to tell everyone about it you know they're quiet and they're just doing their thing mm -hmm. that's really forward thinking of you i usually like the guys that brag i'm like <laughs> walk away <Yeah. laughs> try not to hold conversations with them mm -hmm. it's just me being me being being an asshole but yeah that's really forward thinking i like that i'm not the use that going forward. Mm -hmm. that, I think uh, the, I love that humility though that people have when they come in and they know they're a badass and they'll wait to show you mm -hmm. when they're out. Has anybody ever surprised you? Yeah. Have you been like, oh shit, yeah. when's that coming? The funny thing is you ask about female drivers and a lot of the female drivers actually surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, if I tell, it, the funny thing is when, when men come through, they have a little bit more ego, a little bit more like puffed up chest. Um, so they don't always like listen right off the bat until mm -hmm. they see how we drive and you know they all they know is they've been to the racetrack before they've been driving their corvette and they drive as fast as they can drive and that's to them that's fast and they mm -hmm. come here and somebody walks away from them while still looking in the rearview mirror and still talking to them over the radio then they get a little bit more humble but the female drivers as soon as they come in they just want to learn mm -hmm. so they're listening to everything you tell them mm -hmm. so it's funny you mentioned that uh that it, there is the, a lot of the female drivers surprise me actually because yeah. the, as fast as they learn, their they're learning curve is a lot faster because they listen to everything that, that I'm saying. I also think that because this percentage is so small that you're less likely to get a female that's like, sure, I'll try that, <laughs> right? You're going to have somebody here that it really wants it or mm -hmm. is here for that purpose of learning. Like yeah. it's less of a casual experience, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, very true. Uh, is there any qualities in a student that drive you crazy sounds um, like not listening yeah we talked about it a little bit the boisterous the the egotistical ones which there aren't not a whole uh, there's not a whole lot of them uh the know-it-alls obviously that mm -hmm. um and there's some people that know a whole lot more about the corvette than i do because there's some guys that have had corvettes since aficionados yes uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. um but the ones that are a little that don't listen don't take that advice mm -hmm. um and that that we're given they'll take the coaching very well and they question everything I don't mind if you question, but if you listen and change, then great. But right. sometimes just question to question to question. Devil's question. advocate's one thing, right? Mm -hmm. So to broaden the conversation, to create diversity, that's great. Mm -hmm. But doing it just, I call them snipers. So in what I do in in the classroom environment, there's there can be one person back that every chance they get, they're just digging it in just to prove me wrong or something. Mm -hmm. And so often I'll, I'll find myself just going, I'm okay being wrong. Mm -hmm. That's that's what this conversation's for. As long as we can be productive and fail faster and and move forward. Yeah. Right. I had one gentleman question me online in technique and in front of the whole class. Uh, I don't remember what his specific question was, and I was like, "Well, what your last session? What were you running out there? What was your time?" And he was like, "Oh, 126." And I was like, "Well, the demo lap I showed you is about 10 seconds faster, so." You know, that's where you want to try to get to, that 10 seconds faster. You keep trying what you're going to try. We're just showing you this. This is what we've got. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't mean to, like, put it in your face or anything, but what I just did. <laughs> and because he had asked me over and over and over and over, and I, and I was done talking, I explained the answer several times, and I was finally right. like, you know what? This is the demonstration lap that you, sure. that you drove with me on. This was the lap that I did. If that works for you, keep going. But right. your goal should be to get up to this level. Well, and I think that that's, that's the key, right? So mm -hmm. if this, that's where they want to be. That's the reason they're there. That's the yeah. gap that everybody wants to cross over. Now, are the cars manual or auto? The C8 only comes in what's called a dual clutch transmission. So it's a, it's a manual transmission, but has an apparatus uh, dual clutch. So it basically functions as an automatic and you can use it as an automatic and paddle shifters. Mm. So the simple answer is it's automatic. Do they, do you have any manual? Cause people can bring their old school Corvettes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we don't have any more manuals here. Um, all of our new cars are all the C8. We don't deal with the C7s anymore, but we do private instructions. So you can hire myself or other instructors um, and bring your own car, whether it's a Mercedes, whether it's a Ford, whether it's whatever, and mm -hmm. we'll coach you in it. How, what are some of the lessons that translate into life that you've learned from racing? Uh, I, I think the one that we've hit on first is, is just being humble, not mm -hmm. necessarily being an egotistical maniac just because you've done some cool stuff. 
uh, if there's one thing I've always learned in racing is no matter where I go, whether that's the Ford Racing School or, or working here with Corvette or, or working in off-road, there's always going to be somebody faster. There's mm-hmm. always. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll listen to instructor after instructor after instructor, a season instructor, and I'll still pick up you know, a, a terminology, something to say. I'll still pick up a tip on the racetrack, how something should, how something should feel, how a car should react. I think always being open and, and always being humble about where you're at continues to move you forward faster, if that makes sense. If you've got a puffed up chest, if you've got an ego, you're never going to learn. You're never going to get better and better. Mm-hmm. And what about pushing boundaries that, that, uh, make in a safe kind of controlled environment? Is, do you see that play out outside of? Uh, I, I mean, I guess in, in a way where I see a lot of race car drivers or, or competition driving instructors, people that do motorsports for a living, I see a lot of them a lot more calm on the streets, I guess, mm-hmm. is yeah. the only way I can really think of explaining that. Um, they get their, their, their adrenaline rush out here, so yes. they don't necessarily have to put their families in danger on the street, <laughs> if that's what you mean. That's, um, which is good. Yeah. I just mean pushing the boundaries and pushing limits, because typically people that are adventure seekers, right, adrenaline mm-hmm. seekers, are that way in lots of areas of life, mm-hmm. and versus you know coming and kind of getting that out of our system in an environment like this. Yeah, I mean, I'm not much of a thrill seeker. I've Sure, I've skydived before, I've bungee jumped before. It's not something I regularly seek, maybe because I get my adrenaline here. Um, it's not something that I seek in, in life every single day. Do, do I try to push the boundaries? Mm-hmm. Um, do I try to keep myself um, you know, to the point where I can work and afford to go racing and, and take time off from work to go races? Yes, mm-hmm. do I? Um, but not necessarily like, am I a thrill seeker? Do I go out and try to jump out of a plane every time I can? What's the craziest uh, wreck that you've either seen or been in? I've um, been in several um, rollovers, several crashes. Um, as far as the uh, craziest wreck I've ever seen, I'd have to think about that one for a minute. So uh, 2018, we were racing a UTV. Um, I was coaching a gentleman. We were What's in, UTV? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, a, a Polaris or a Can-Am, side-by-side, basically. Um, oh, like can, the Razor type Thing. It's a Razor, Polaris okay. Razor, a Can-Am Maverick. Sorry, I keep saying UTV, and that's just the general term for Kawasaki. Utility Honda. something uh, Yeah, uh, like an SUV, but UTV. So uh, u- utility, t- uh, like an all-terrain vehicle, but a utility terrain vehicle, okay. essentially. Uh, and it's just kind of their nicknames for all Got UTVs. Which I'm going is... to use it. And see. <laughs> if you have a Polaris or a Can-Am, that's what they're referred to as a UTV. Um, we were racing a Polaris Razor, and it's not your normal Polaris Razor, full tube frame body, which means we only use the steering rack, the, the motor, the transmission uh, from the actual Polaris. So you have to keep the same track width, um, but we were racing, uh, and I was coaching a gentleman. Um, we came through a session that was basically like a cat track. We were climbing a cliff, climbing up the side of the mountain. The car got a little squirrely. Um, it drove up the mountain, jumped, and then flipped on our side. Um, yeah. That was probably my worst wreck. Um, there, so you were, there, in, you were in it? Yeah, I was wow. coaching the gentleman at the time. Uh, I was supposed to take over. After. Did you tell him at the end, don't do that? <laughs> uh, I couldn't because he was one of those uh, egotistical maniacs that blamed it on me because I didn't uh. point out something. I didn't tell him something. Mm-hmm. I said, you were the one with the wheel, man. You were the one that rolled right. us over. But right. I, I haven't been involved in a whole lot of – I've been in like four or five rollovers, and, and that was probably the worst one. One similar I, – I remember it was like in – the late 90s, I've just aged myself probably, but it was, we were driving to California, and you know how, for those that live on the West Coast, how the mountains, they kind of chop the mountain for, to drive through, mm-hmm. and so there's kind of two little berms, whatever. So we were driving along, and this guy in front of us, it was my mom and I in the car, were like kind of, was kind of started swerving in and out to the center lane, but it was right by the median. It was a really, not a place that somebody would swerve, and it's, mm-hmm. I mean, pre-cell phones, right? And so now we just go, look at this idiot texting, right? But, <laughs> but it wasn't like that. And so we're like, what is he doing? And then all of a sudden, it turns out he fell asleep and woke up and completely like jerked the wheel over corrected and hit one of those berms. But because he's going so fast, like drove halfway up this damn thing and then flipped end over end and like spun around on its hood as we went, ah, oh. like it happened so fast. And it was back in those things, we stopped at a call box, mm-hmm. you know, for anybody that remembers yeah. this kind of stuff. And um, for sure, I don't know if that individual made it, whatever, I can't imagine, but it was the gnarliest thing I think I've That's wild. ever seen. You know, on the street, I haven't, I have been in one accident. It was when I was 16 years old uh, in racing. I've been in four or five others, but nothing, 
Nothing wild. Roll over. Listen, I mean, like, like not, knock on wood. Knock yeah, on wood. We as don't. I leave tomorrow for Mexico. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to, <laughs> to go race. That, that juju yeah. can't happen as a result of the of the hot box. Yeah. Um, can you share a funny story? Um, 2017 uh, Baja 1000. Again, I know I keep talking about the Baja 1000. Um, we were coming to the finish line. We were in a little teeny town called Ojos Negros. I got in the truck at 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and after chasing it from, same noon on Friday, I got in the truck on 7.30 in the morning, drove it till about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, my co-driver, uh, well, another co-driver, we did a pit stop, fuel, tires. My other co-driver got in because I was falling asleep. So I got in the co-driver spot and um, he was driving. 30 minutes in, I was asleep in, in a race in mm. the truck because I'd been up for so many hours. Mm. Um, it wasn't the tequila at Ojos Negros. <laughs> I hope not. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I had fallen asleep in the truck mm -hmm. and um, I woke up and with the driver screaming at me. He was a good buddy of mine named Tony. We were on our side in a ravine oh, and no. I'm staring at dirt. There was dirt all outside the window here. Oh, yeah. He's like, I'm off track. I don't know where I went. You fell asleep. Um, what do we do? So I climbed out of the truck and luckily we're on our side, but in kind of like a V-shaped ravine. So you had room to... We muscled it like, yeah, back on two wheels and then kind of backed it out the ravine. Um, and then I you know, strapped myself in tighter, popped an Adderall and kept going. <laughs> no joke. Should we have said that? I, I mean, don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's really a what legal happened. prescription, <laughs> a legal prescription of that. But that's really what happened. We drove across the finish line, um, at, uh, two 30, in the morning. Um, wow. and then we drove to the taco stand, the race truck to the taco stand and in my race suit, and then the tequila and tacos nice. at like, and we were there till like four 30 in the morning. Love that. Perfect so. way to end. All right. Fi fill in the blank for me. If I could, I would blank every day. Um, if I could, I would drift cars all day long. Really? So I, I teach off-road. I teach on-road. I love drifting. Sliding cars around is kind of like my fun thing. If I can do that and didn't have to work on cars and have to put tires on the cars, if I can just drift all day long, I would do that. Slide cars around, I would do that all day long. I actually want to uh, look for a piece of property here in Pahrump that I could buy five acres, ten acres, Put a warehouse, live in the loft, and drift, and have and a little drift dirt truck. All the time. Yeah, I would love that. Hmm. I, I like this plan. All right, answer or another fill in the blank. The world would be a better place if. I we've talked about it a lot. I think the the world would be a lot better place if you were humble about your your career. You were humble about just your direction in life, um, and if you went after it. If, if more people were involved in what what they love, mm -hmm. you know, not just had a job for a job if they are passionate about what they do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if that's police work, if that's construction. If you're passionate about what you do, not just punch the clock. Yeah. I, I think people, and Americans especially, and even myself sometimes, get in the habit of punching a clock just to pay the next bill, just to pay the next house payment, just to pay the mortgage. And, and yeah. I think if more people were humble about themselves and life in general and chase their passion, Mm -hmm. uh, I think the world would be a better place. You're right. And say we're engaged in their life. That's why we have the learn in Learn, Love, Kick Ass in this podcast, because it is always about gaining new knowledge and learning mm -hmm. from one another. And what a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much <laughs> for course. being here. Let's head out to our shout out. My name is Sango from Kenya, and I'm listening to Brandy on Hot Box. Thank you to Sango from Kenya and all of our Kenyan family that are out there and for the shout out. Thank you again to Jason Smith for being here with us today and sharing all of your words of wisdom. Uh, this is my favorite time of the whole podcast. This is when we kick some ass. So you've already given so many delicious tips about being humble and staying passionate. Are there any, is there any piece of advice or action item that you say, get out there and do this starting now? What would that be? Whatever your passion is, go do it, whatever that is. Again, whether that's police work, whether that's you love mountain biking, whether that's racing cars, go do it. Go do it. You will make yourself, the people around you, much happier. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things that I think was really great that we talked about today is pushing the boundaries in a controlled way, ensuring safety. It also is enhancing our focus by trying different mediums, right? So whether it's dirt or asphalt or water or applying to any of the businesses and, and industries that each of us are part of out, that our listeners, watchers, followers, that uh, to try to switch it up so you don't get into that mundane, so you don't get muscle memory to a place that we 
aren't growing and building. And so we can try different things. Any others? That's all I got. I can't think of anything. That's, a, that's how I've, uh, you know, uh, before I started racing, I worked and managed a discount tire. Mm -hmm. And a great company, loved seeing people every day, hated the job. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants, nobody's excited to buy a set of tires. I started. No, you're right. Normally we're pissed. <laughs> Everybody's pissed. pissed. Yeah. Everybody's pissed. <laughs> I started racing cars and was like, I got to figure out a way to do this every single day to mm -hmm. be involved. People are happy. I'm happy. I love the, uh, I love the adrenaline rush. I want to be better and better at this. I figured you were going to leave us with some sort of live hard, drive fast, some sort of like tagline, something that's tattooed across your <laughs> chest or something. No, not, not my MO. Like that. No. Not my MO. Chase your passion. Have fun. Go do something that, that you've always been interested in because in the end, what are you going to tell some, what are you going to leave with your kids? Uh, mm -hmm. I was an accountant, you know. Uh, hey. Take, take, take. I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean I that love, about accounting. I wanted to be an accountant but, when I was little. <laughs> take, take those trips. My dad drove on the racetrack. Yeah, he's an accountant, but he went to the racetrack every month and he loved it. He went dirt bike riding every Living. month and he loved it. He went mountain biking every month and he loved it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. If people wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Uh, best way to do so, I, I, I guess, is Instagram, uh, jorts.lol, and the jorts is spelled with a Z. Do you wear jorts? I do. I drive a Corvette, so I have to, and I have oh, new, new balances. Is that too. a oh, new balances Is that a requirement to wear, to wear jorts? I think they give them to you when you buy a Corvette. She, she gives <laughs> you, you get, jorts. I'm you sure. get a pair of jorts yeah. with it. Uh, well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you to all of you, our faithful followers and listeners. And just so you know, those Tree to Hot boxes in all your favorite spots: Spotify, Apple. Uh, and any sort of podcast place. We have uh, Roku. We even have an app on Roku. So if you want to sit on your couch and download uh, and eat some popcorn and watch the TJ Hotbox, you can do that as well. iHeartRadio. Where else, Nick? Where am I forgetting? You got them. I got, we got them all. We're out there. <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Brandy Love, B-R-A-N-D-I-L-U-V, and at Strategic Hotbox. Thank you, Jason. Thank you to all of you. Until I see you again, get out there and kick some ass. <laughs>